Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Josh Bassages, Director and CEO of the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, and Gary Tintero, Director of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Thank you for joining us, uh, both of you. It's just such a pleasure to have you coming in from different parts of the continent. And a reminder to, uh, to our webcast guests, you can ask questions through the Q&A functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show. So we're in these crazy times, right? I mean, this, this whole situation, I mean, who would have thought five years ago that a pandemic in several months uh, would have had such a big impact on our communities, on, the, on nations across the world? And now we're also dealing with the reckoning that uh, this continent has in terms of its, uh, it, its treatment of people of color, um, all the way ba back uh, from uh, the European settlers' treatments of natives. Um, let's, let's talk about how you're dealing, just sort of a check-in. And um, let's, let's start with uh, Gary. Would you like to take it? Um, so as many people on this call will know, um, Texas was among the first states to reopen. The governor uh, ordained that on May 1 and allowed some entities, including museums, to reopen at 25% capacity uh, starting May 1. We had a bit of a heads up <clears throat> in the 10 days prior to the announcement for May 1, and we began to accelerate our uh, return to work task force, ordering supplies, getting ready to reopen safely. And um, it was after our neighbor, the Museum of uh, Natural Sciences had reopened on May 15, and we saw that their reopening went successfully. And most importantly, the visitors were wearing their masks, observing social distancing, you, you know, using hand sanitizer on, upon arrival, that we realized, okay, uh, we do have an audience ready to participate uh, according to these guidelines. And so we opened um, five days, six days later to members on, on May 20th and to the public on May 23rd. It's gone exceedingly well. And I'm glad we, even though Houston is now experiencing a spike in, in new COVID cases, uh, and that's extremely unfortunate, um, I don't feel that our museum is contributing to that. Uh, and the reason that I, I mean, the, <clears throat> the facts that my belief is founded on is that we now have mandatory testing for frontline staff at the museum, people who engage with the public more than 15 minutes in the course of a day. And we don't see any spread among colleagues. Uh, we've had a handful of cases, three or four cases of uh, positive COVID tests since we reopened. Um, and yet we don't see any lateral spread to colleagues or, or other museum staff. Uh, so people are the unfortunate who have who've tested positive usually are getting it at home from a family member. Um, fortunately, everyone's recovered, no one's been hospitalized, and so we thank God for that. Um, so I'm glad there's no community spread on our premises. I'm glad that we're able to provide our service, our mission to provide these experiences, connecting people with work of art, with their history, with their culture, and more importantly, with their familiar places. Of course, members were most eager to return. Uh, I saw people crying in the galleries. I saw people holding hands and kissing in the galleries, uh, not socially distanced kissing, but couples who came in together. And, uh, and that reaffirmed how important our places are to the community. So you're, uh, you're yeah. um, modeling best practices globally, right? You're, you're asking people to remain socially distant. You're asking them to wear masks. They're cooperating, right? You're bringing people in, but you're providing testing all the time. You're basically doing what we should all do, right? Josh, you're going to be opening in, in a few days, right? Yes, well, that's true, Mark. And first of all, I want to say I'm glad to be here uh, on the M. Oppenheim Nonprofit Report and certainly uh, appreciate the work you do, Mark. And I would also say that I have had the pleasure of being on nearly weekly calls with Gary over the last couple of months. And so uh, the MFA in uh, Houston got a jump ahead, and it's been really a pleasure to see Gary and his team navigate this reopening. So yes, we are on the cusp of reopening. This is a big week for us. This is actually the first day that I am back physically in the museum. So that's very exciting. Uh, we're opening to our members on Thursday, uh, the 9th and opening to the general public on the 11th. 
and we have been working through every conceivable sort of issue of a team of about 50 on a reopening working group, learning from Gary and others and trying to make sure that we can create an experience that is safe, that allows social distancing and will allow the people of, uh, of Toronto and Ontario and beyond to return to the ROM, which they're eager to do. What's so interesting is you're both talking about learning from the medical professionals and um, finding out how to both persevere in this environment, which we all have to do. We are going to be living with this for a long time. We have to persevere, we have to continue to operate. But to do it safely, my goodness, I mean, it's the least we can do for our friends and the, and the people who support our, whether it's a business or a nonprofit, right? In terms of, of the frequency of testing, we got a, a question uh, from uh, some of the attendees in terms of how frequently the testing uh, happens. Gary, how many, how many days between tests do you do for frontline staff? Uh, we're offering testing uh, weekly. And it, uh, what prompted it is um, the fact that we were going to have uh, summer camps, um, both in one of our house museums, Biobend, and at our Glassell Art School. But just as those camps were to open, um, we, uh, Harris County, uh, in, didn't in, enforce a new law, but a strong recommendation for stay at home and uh, because of the spike in cases. And, we've, uh, and with specific language having to do with camps and, and classrooms. And so although we had it figured out, no more than eight students in a classroom, social distancing, et cetera, we felt it unwise to contradict uh, a very strong recommendation from our county officials. Um, but it was on, on that basis that we were going to have those instructors tested weekly to make sure that we were not bringing any staff member into contact uh, with, a, with a student who, you know, that they might possibly spread the infection. And Josh, so that's you, have, what, yeah. you have a similarly large organization. Um, as, you, as you open up, what are your plans? Because Gary has already uh, talked about this sort of wave of people who came in who just needed to be within the environs of, uh, of the museum and be together in some form. Are you going to be controlling the initial uh, entries and are you going to have uh, people on staff or, or brought in to do that kind of testing in that same kind of regimen? Yeah, well, you know, we, we are, again, having the opportunity to learn from both not only the, the healthcare and medical establishment, but also other institutions like Gary's, and we're taking advantage of that to put that to work to create a safe environment here. The context in Toronto is, is a little bit different than some uh, parts of the states in that uh, there has been a, a very high degree of social isolation. Uh, we were only permitted to go into what is called stage two here in, in Ontario um, in the last week. Uh, there, there are very low, out of the 15 or more million uh, population of Ontario, there are less than 200 cases a day right now. And yesterday there was a big headline, no deaths. So we're in an environment where we've been very careful and uh, the context of transmission hopefully has been and will remain low. Having said that, and I know that there are people on the, on the call that have been looking at these kinds of questions, we began by asking, you know, we, we thought perhaps we want to, we're, we're one large single building. I know, Gary, you have multiple buildings. Uh, we began by saying, do we want to just have a portion of the museum open? We have two main entrances. Do we want only one of the entrances open? Do we want to have people following a specific path? And what became clear is that for museums, unlike, say, our colleagues in the, in the performing arts, we have nearly 270,000 square feet of gallery and public space to be able to distribute people in. And um, so that actually opening the whole museum uh, opening both entrances so people don't have to pass each other or wait in lines or things like that seem to be the better pattern. Obviously, we're doing things, we're requiring masks, uh, both for staff and the public. Uh, we have put up plexi in all the places that you can imagine plexi ought to go up. Uh, we are having time ticketing so that people are uh, acquiring their ticket in advance so that we can have a touchless entry process and uh, no change of cash. At, at the doors and all of those we've learned from our wonderful colleagues who are doing great work. So um, in terms of, of how this has worked for you, Gary, you also have opened up all, because you have a very complicated facility to manage. It's, it, you know, Josh has two entrances. Of course, the, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston is, well, it's, it's quite a, kind of porous in certain respects. 
It is, but we did the same thing. We limited, uh, so the public entrance is only one, and, uh, but we have several exits. Uh, so that's helped. Um, uh, we don't have a single, there is no, I wish we did have a single path through our buildings that made sense, but it doesn't. But we haven't had a problem with social distancing. And by the way, we don't have the density that Toronto has uh, for Houston. And, and, um, and so we're, have, we're drawing between 300 on a low day and 1,100 on a very high day. Uh, we have, you know, the fire marshal capacity is 7,000 at a time. So there, it's actually optimal visiting, um, you know, characteristics. In the old days, people would pay a premium to be able to visit an exhibition by themselves, to have the galleries to oneself, to come in the museum after hours. That's what the building feels like now, after hours, because one rarely encounters other people. When you visit an exhibition, there might be a dozen people over 10,000 square feet. So it's ideal conditions to commune with works of art. It's really ideal to have a significant experience. I do think that people with the anxiety that's prevalent in our society right now, it's difficult for people to switch gears, calm down, and actually get in the receptive mode. Uh, we've all become, you know, news and pandemic junkies. And, uh, and I do see people having, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of a change for them, but I think a welcome change and a necessary change for our, for our culture. And, and it's, so, it's so necessary. We're all, we're all under so much stress, right? This is, the, the museums are the institutional response to storytellers, right? Or minstrels, mm -hmm. right? They tell us a little bit about ourselves, right? It's a little bit different. It's in a, it comes in a different form. And, and we, can, we, we can actually calm ourselves through the interaction with art. So it's a very essential uh, service that you provide. Um, and, and there's this whole other issue that we're all facing. While we're facing this, uh, the, the, this pandemic, um, we have come to a reckoning uh, in our discussion surrounding race on this continent, right? In Europe, um, in the world. Um, how are you um, trying to deal with that aspect? Because it's, it's, it's kind of a place that museums haven't necessarily addressed to the extent that perhaps in the past we should have, but now we must and, and we need to change how we operate. How are you changing how your institutions are operating? And, and could you also describe the, the, the special situation that you face in Toronto and then Gary that you face, because they're different, but they're related. Well, one of the specific aspects of being in Toronto is Toronto is said to be the most diverse major city in the world. More than 50% of the population of Toronto was not born uh, in Canada. And so we have this wonderfully diverse community, a wonderfully diverse audience, and frankly, our collections uh, match that diversity. From its founding, the Ram has been a global museum, uh, which is uh, very helpful to us in terms of thinking about these issues. I know that for me and for the Ram in general, um, the question of how we can uh, continue to address issues of uh, racial justice, of inclusion, of equity in our institutions, not just in terms of what we're doing with our programming and our exhibitions, as important as that is, but frankly, the harder day-to-day -day work of making sure that, that the people in the institutions, the people that are running the institutions, not just our trustees or our staff, but also our volunteers reflect that diversity. It's not easy. We've been working hard at it in our programming and in our hiring and other ways. There's a long way to go, but I think uh, we're absolutely committed to it. And just interestingly, I would say that from my own perspective, um, one of the very first, I've been at the ROM now uh, a little over four years, and in the first couple of months that I was here, one of the very important pieces of work that we as an institution needed to do and that I needed to lead uh, was making a public apology uh, to the Black Canadian community for an exhibition that actually was nearly 30 years old uh, in the 1980s that was called Into the Heart of Africa, uh, which uh, created a great deal of protest at the time and was a perceived to be in very, and, and was uh, the experience of it was as a racist exhibition, uh, though that was not the intent, but that was uh, very much felt to be that way. And, and we needed to be able to turn a page and say, we accept that that, whatever the intent may have been, 
was an exhibition that was racist in its experience, and how do we move beyond that and ensure that we are over decades? That's work that's ongoing work, but it's so very important because we want to be an institution that is felt to be a place for everybody in our community to see themselves represented and to feel comfortable and welcomed in. So um, it's interesting over the last few months where, of course, COVID-19 was such a focus, and then as we all understand that starting with uh, the, you know, the recent protests that it was absolutely absolutely critical that we turn our attention to saying how can we as an institution do better, do more in that area. And Gary, you also foster a huge discussion and you have an incredibly diverse city. Yeah, and I would say, you know, when I, I always enjoy my trips to Toronto and I always think it feels like Houston uh, in terms of the diversity. When you go into a restaurant in Toronto, go into a restaurant in Houston, you're going to see the same range, you know, the, the same range. Um, maybe uh, more uh, people of Asian ethnicity in, in Toronto than in, than in Houston, but every city has its, you know, um, demographic. Um, I'll say when I came to my uh, job eight years ago, um, I made a priority and was accepted by board leadership as an institutional priority to diversify the staff in the audience. And, um, and the programming had already uh, been placed on a track towards diversity in 2000, I came in 2012. But my predecessor, Peter Marzio, launched um, an enormous, highly influential program in Latin American art, led by one of the stars, Mary Carmen Ramirez, in the field. It's our, it's our biggest curatorial department. It's our most expensive curatorial department. We have long had uh, an African-American uh, collection, and, and we've doubled down on it in the eight years I've been there. Among the most expensive works of art that we've bought since I've been here are works by African-American artists, women, men, etc., historical as well as um, brand new works of art. Uh, so we're trying to make our collection ever more representative. It's been a bit of a challenge because until this coming October, we haven't had a building for modern and contemporary art which is the largest part of our collection, which is almost completely unseen. Starting in November, we will show the art of the last 120 years, and there we will have much greater representation of Latin American and African American, as well as Native American traditional arts. Uh, so programming, I think, will become more visible. Our, I just have the stats, because I had to run them for somebody. Of our 660 uh, staff members, we have about 54% people of color, in our management teams, we have about 30 to 33% uh, people of color, uh, including in our curatorial staff. And, um, and, and the most difficult, as Josh knows for all of us museum directors, the most difficult are to find um, uh, uh, people of color for curatorial hires. Uh, much easier for, you know, for communications or for design and graphics, exhibition design, uh, registrar, et cetera. These areas, uh, there are extraordinary candidates uh, from all ethnicities. <clears throat> we have been, uh, since I've been there now six or seven years, uh, a participant in a program funded by the Mellon Foundation to help nurture uh, new talent in the, uh, in the curatorial ranks, uh, where we, uh, we ask local universities to identify uh, potential candidates uh, for internships whom we support as, as well as we possibly can and try to convert them into art historians, send them to graduate school and hope that we can hire them back. And already uh, we've had a number of graduates who've gone on to work at Studio Museum of Harlem out of Houston, uh, Los Angeles County Museum. And so this is, this is a funnel for new diversity uh, in the museum field in what is a crucial profession, uh, curatorial. But for, out of 660 people, you know, I have 30 working in curatorial departments. Everyone else is working everywhere else. And that's where we've been able to make tremendous strides in terms of diversification. I also want to say that what we do, and I encourage my colleagues to do, is to create um, groups, listening groups, um, or speaking groups, groups that we can listen to. We have a Latin American Advisory Council. We have an African American Art Advisory Council, the, the, Afri the call it 5A, African American Art Advisory Council. They've been in business 30 something years at our museum. And the Latin American, we founded just three years ago. But these, this is, it's great to have, uh, you know, sometimes uncomfortable uh, conversations with these representatives of community leaders, uh, hear what they have to say, try to implement their, their recommendations, but also 
uh, they act then as ambassadors to their communities to help create a better um, bond uh, with our neighbors. And, Gar and Josh, you do the same kind of thing with native communities across Canada and other communities, don't well, you? The indigenous piece is hugely important and that's a, a very critical part of both our collections and our work here. We're in the final stages of hiring a new curator of indigenous art and culture that will be themselves someone of an indigenous heritage. But I did want to just reinforce the point that uh, Gary was making, which is the pipeline issue that it's very, very important uh, to be encouraging emerging professionals and young people to be choosing to enter these fields, people of color who might not necessarily see museums as the obvious place or art history or this work or curatorial work. And uh, so that's been something on my radar for quite a while. When I was at the Peabody Essex Museum before coming here, uh, we launched uh, a very important Native American fellows program that really sought to, uh, to bring a number of emerging professionals into a context where they could develop their curatorial and, and also leadership practice. Uh, we do similar work here at the ROM, and I'm really thrilled that recently um, we had a number of Black business people from Toronto come forward to fund a series of five internships for Black young people to come into curatorial fields to create that pipeline so people see a future for themselves, can be mentored, uh, and so that we're moving in a direction where hopefully we will increasingly see diversity in, um, in the curatorial ranks as well as in other areas, and not just as important as it is, for instance, to be hiring, uh, we have a wonderful curator of South Asian art or Chinese art who are themselves from of South Asian heritage or Chinese heritage, but wouldn't it be wonderful to see someone who is of South Asian heritage, as we do in different cases, doing contemporary art or perhaps doing Chinese art or doing other areas so that we make this a context in which, uh, regardless of people's background, uh, there are roles for them across the institution. And I think that that's very much the important work ahead, though I also acknowledge challenging work. And I think one of the things that we find are question people rightly ask the question about accountability. Do you see a trend? Can you see progress? And can we share that? And we are actually this week launching a web page at the ROM that will be devoted to our holding ourselves in a way that we can demonstrate the numbers, the work that we're doing, and see quarter by quarter progress toward a set of goals. You're, you're each making such important points. It is important to have a pipeline of talent because only in this way can we ensure that the uh, institutions are embedded with attitudes that match the need for interpretation, interpretive experience, and knowledge, right? There is a lived experience, a perspective that these institutions have been deprived of for so long. And, and that only comes by a change of, of staff and a diversity of staff. Uh, we also find it very difficult, uh, uh, frankly, uh, to, to uh, find uh, people who want to bet their career as museum directors, people of color, because there is this tendency of restricting um, opportunity um, or uh, say every Latino cur uh, curator must be a, a director of a, of a, of a, uh, of a museum of, of Hispanic heritage um, or Jew has to be a museum of only Jewish museums or a Christian can only be a I mean, it doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, you can have a, a, a head of Islamic art, you know, run Harvard museums, right? Uh, or or uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, how do you uh, drive that kind of change? Because you can't just go to the usual suspects when you hire curators. If you're going to change your practice, you actually have to change your practice. How do you think beyond the, the models that we all grew up in to create the new museum, today's museum for today's audiences. You know, there's a great uh, urgency now, a sense of urgency, and it's because people are at home, uh, they have more time to reflect on, on their society and culture, and they see that we've come up wanting. And, uh, and so I welcome this urgency, uh, but I will say it didn't take the tragic killing of George Floyd um, for us to, to make hires of people of color. We've been doing it for eight years. We have uh, highly varied programs. We happen to have just opened last week, Soul of a Nation, this great exhibition that's been traveling around uh, the country in Europe um, about uh, protest art and African-American artists 
of the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. So we're right there, you know, in, in, in the moment. I like to remind my critics that it's taken 100 years. My, my building have, will, will soon be open 100 years. And uh, it's taken 100 years to get where we are. Uh, we cannot transform ourselves overnight. And as you yourself said, Mark, uh, there is a pipeline problem. Uh, it's not as if we have wide choice, frankly, for most of our curatorial positions. They're not that competitive. There are very few people going into curatorial practice right now of any color or stripe. And, and, uh, and then to find someone who, you know, whose who's own personal drive and goals and career path matches what the institution can provide in terms of resources, very, very difficult. But that doesn't mean we're not going to, that we're going to stop trying. We're going to try as hard as we can. And, you know, the, an African-American artist in Houston said the other day in, in, in one of our local publications, hey man, I'm not expecting art museums or artists to be able to solve this social problem. It's an immense problem that's 400 years in the making. We can't snap our fingers and wake up in an entirely different world. But what we can do as institutions is model the society that we wish we had, that we want to be. And we can teach tolerance, create, teach curiosity, uh, encourage the best possible behavior and, uh, and communication among societies. What I find particularly troubling right now is divisiveness uh, and the focusing on difference. Uh, as opposed to, as you say, uh, you know, looking for common ground and, and creating, you know, creating Muslim curators of European art and European curators of Islamic art, and for that to happen without it being colonizing or patronizing or, or any of these, uh, you know, terrible syndromes that we've been experiencing. Uh, we need to get to a place where, you know, intellectual exploration and scientific inquiry can be conducted by anyone of any color in any of our institutions. It's sort of what you both do, right? You're, it's sort of be patient, but go faster. Be patient, but go faster, right? I mean, that's right. I mean, you, you both, we've seen you transform your institutions. Uh, J Josh, you're in a, you're an earlier part of the art, right? So it's almost like a history lesson here. Um, how, how are you dealing with that, with that combination of being patient and go faster, Josh? Well, I, I just uh, want to actually, first of all, certainly concur with the, the, the Gary's excellent remarks and say we can't solve the problems, but we as museums are places of gathering, places of insight, places of experience. Uh, you know, one of our sort of tag phrases at the ROM is uh, to help people come together to understand the past, make sense of the present, and develop a shared future. And that's the kind of role that we as museums can play. So I don't think we can solve it. And I want to make it very clear, whatever work we have done, which there has been quite a bit, whatever work we are doing, I just want to acknowledge it's not enough. We have so much more to do. That is the path we are on. But I do feel that museums can play a role in this, uh, a critical role in, in, in this discussion and in this very critical societal change. You know, that's the thing. The museum is a place for people to learn other perspectives conveyed in other ways than we typically experience. And that includes this whole idea of bringing people into the museum in a safe way. These conversations need to drive forward. There's a lot of uh, 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 view out there that if we're not finding um, curators of color, we're not looking hard enough. There's also the view that the pipeline needs to adjust. There's also the view that we need to change how we interact with audiences. So how do we, let, let's focus as we close out on, on the latter piece. Are these times having a um, sustained, are they going to have a sustained impact on how you orchestrate what you do within the buildings? You, you shape your staffs in particular ways, you shape competencies, you create workflows, you create ways of uh, putting on exhibitions and, and programming. Are these going to have sustained uh, impact now? Um, uh, Gary, let's, let's start with you and we'll let Josh have the last word. Yeah, well, you know, it's the impact of, of COVID and the pandemic and the economic fallout as a result uh, is enormous. And it seems to me that the change is incalculable at this moment. I can tell you, having been open for almost six weeks now, this is not a sustainable operation. I can't continue 
this way for another year. I mean, I could, but uh, our financial situation would be very, very different. We'll have to make accommodations. If we're going to be in this reduced status with reduced visitation and essentially no you know, earned income, you know, a year from now, we'll have to make some very difficult decisions regarding staffing. And, um, and that, of course, is going to work contrary to what we're just trying to do, which is to say, do more with more people. Uh, and more people of color and bringing in new talent and new points of view. So I think there's, there's going to be a conflict between what we want to do and what we must do as a result of, of the pandemic. I can't see what the economy is going to be like a year from now. I hope to God it's, it's better off than, than we are now. And as exhilarated as I am by challenge, and I love nothing more than a challenge uh, to, uh, to, to work, uh, toward these great social goals, uh, I recognize that the um, economics of running an operation at a reduced capacity is going to be a, a, a tremendous difficulty. So it's not only an economic imperative that we uh, lick this coronavirus and that we discipline ourselves, it's a justice imperative, isn't it, Gary? I mean, yeah, in, yeah. In, in order to ch make the change that we know we need to make, we have to lick this virus. Josh, are you finding the same idea prevalent in, in Toronto? What we're talking about is the, the near-term issues and the long-term issues. And I think we need to keep our eye on the ball of the long-term issues, these uh, structural changes, this effort to fight structural racism in a systemic way. And I think we need to maintain our commitment to that, and as you say, COVID-19 and the coronavirus are, are, are an equity and social issue as well as a medical and health issue, because of course, there's been a disproportionate impact on uh, those, uh, those most in need populations and, and the diverse populations that we've been talking about. So that's true. Uh, but I think that, that while we are working our way through this time where we like uh, Houston, we've lost 30% of our uh, earned uh, or our earned and contributed support as we project for this year. Uh, we've been closed for four months. I'm excited about the doors opening this very week. Uh, I would say that to your question, um, we've all focused more on our digital programs and our uh, online endeavors, and I think we want to maintain that because it gives us a chance to reach out beyond, well beyond our facilities. I think from a staff perspective, looking at the question of how has working from home uh, been going and are there opportunities there that change the nature of work in museums as with elsewhere, but all of that needs to be about how do we get beyond this point and how do we continue this effort to uh, to engage as museums in uh, a fight for uh, better equity and better uh, racial justice and um, inclusion. Josh Bassages of the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, Gary Tidero, Museum of Fine Arts Houston, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Uh, it's just been a great conversation and, we'll, and I'm sure we'll continue beyond. Uh, thank you attendees for asking your questions and that's the nonprofit report. Thank you all for attending.